people who say that the bad things can be explained because they're all part of God's mysterious plan. But the Bible has a great deal in it about God's plan. And uh, I thought it was time that we should uh, start to look at that in a systematic sort of way. And I don't know any better place to start than the book of Ephesians. Because there we have a great deal about God's mysterious plan. I want to read you uh, the first few verses of Ephesians in a translation that you're now accustomed to hear. I believe that the first chapter of Ephesians suffers more from bad translation than most chapters. And that a good translation gives us the spirit much, much better than the ones that we're accustomed to reading. Here is a translation called the Jerusalem Bible. And then I'll read from the New English Bible. I want you to enjoy these. I, I have enjoyed these greatly. And I think it will do. From Paul, appointed by God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus, to the saints who are faithful to Christ Jesus, praise and peace to you from God, our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God, blessed be God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with all the spiritual blessings of heaven in Christ. Before the world was made, he chose us, chose us in Christ to be holy and spotless and to live through love in his presence, determining that we should become his adopted sons through Jesus Christ for his own kind purposes. To make us praise the glory of his grace, his free gift to us in the beloved, in whom through his blood we gain our freedom, the forgiveness of our sins, such as the richness of his grace, which he has showered on us in his wisdom and insight. He has let us know the mystery of his purpose, his hidden plan, which he so kindly made in Christ from the beginning. To act upon when the times had run their course to the end, that he would bring everything together under Christ as head. Everything in the heavens and everything on earth. And it is in him that we were claimed as God's own. Those are the first of ten verses in the Jerusalem Bible. And they're good. And I think they're even better. In the New English Bible. I want to read it to you in the New English Bible. There's nothing hard in it. When you read in the King James Version, the first ten verses, there are a few things you say, oh, that sounds wrong, that sounds hard. That's a misunderstanding of the Greek. I have great confidence in the British when they translate Greek. Because everyone in Britain who ever gets educated enough to be a clergy person, let alone a scholar, has been studying Greek from the time they were three. They start Greek and they learn Greek as well as they know English. In all of the great schools, all of the schools which bring up the people who are then going on to Oxford and Cambridge or any other great university, they all know Greek and Latin. When I graduated from high school here, I had had more Greek than most students get in their lifetime in <coughs> education. My father had hired the Greek teacher from and the Greek and Latin teacher from Panchart, when he was still a, just a teacher there, to come in his free time and teach Greek to me and my brother David. And when I went to Panchart, I kept on studying Greek. And uh, then I went to Harvard, and my 
my dad insisted that I should major in Latin and Greek. Because he wanted me to go on to be a very big biblical scholar. I didn't think Latin and Greek that much. And I was having trouble with the courses at Harvard because the courses at Harvard assumed that I only knew Latin and Greek. And that what I was going to be learning there was Sophocles and Praxedia and all of the all of the different Greek playwrights and Thomas and Terence and read Latin plays and understand the philosophy of the civilization through the language which I was supposed to already know. And I did know the language, but I did not understand the, the Greek culture and the plays and the products and so on. I didn't understand the humor in Plotus and Terence, the Latin plays, when I knew that I was supposed to read that I did read. And I didn't understand the, the whole business of Sophocles. The, the first play I had to read there was the Antigone. I read Sophocles and Antigone, and it's all about a tremendous conflict over the fact that there's this woman who wants to bury her brother. Hello? <laughs> and the ruler, the governor, won't let her bury her brother. So there's this tremendous conflict for hundreds of pages over whether she can bury her brother. And finally, you know, she buried it in the middle of the night. She sneaks out and buries her brother and gets killed for it. Well, is this, you know, it's just a foreign country now, 14, 15. But in Britain, they all have the background for this, and they do it. When I graduated from high school and went to Britain for one year in a British school, I was ahead of them all in math. But in Greek, they were all way ahead of me. Way ahead of me. They're 12 years old, and they knew a lot more than I did, and I've been studying it for years. Because they study it from childhood. John Stuart Mill read Greek to his son. John Turbo's father read Greek to him in the cradle. You know, you read Good Night Moon or <laughs> He was reading him the Made in I eat they are Pele of Joe Kaleo Sulamane Kamuya Kyle and Shall you think he's reading to him the Iliad and the Odyssey in Greek. I don't know anymore about that. Don't be intimidated. I know two lines. Two lines in the open. But they know it all. And the way here you see, you remember how Lucy used to quote Shakespeare from time to time with some ease? Well, the British, they quote Homer with the same kind of ease.